love to explore nature. Some of my best friends are animals. <laughs> I'm Isabel Yamazaki. I love technology and inventions. Yep, I'm a geek. Hi, Giles. Hi, I'm Giles. Artificial intelligence at your service. Together, we're exploring how amazing discoveries in nature are helping us design brilliant new human inventions. New technology that will make our world a better, greener and more amazing place to live. <laughs> Today we find out which animal might help blind people to see. You're exactly right. <laughs> and what animal can help us design better and more efficient buildings? The answers will amaze you because, because they're, they're wild, wild but true. true. what it's like to be blind. I've got my phone here, which I'm going to record myself using a new night vision app. OK. Blindfold on. Night vision lighting, please. It's really hard because I feel like I've lost all sense of my surroundings. This is actually really scary. I feel lost. I couldn't imagine going everywhere like this. I would need some help. I wonder if there's a way for blind people to see their world better so that they don't have any accidents and can get around. Oh. Science might have some of the answers, Isabel. Hey, Giles. There has been a lot of research into developing new gadgets that can help vision-impaired people see better. Some of the answers come from particular animals and their remarkable ability. Any ideas? Um, <laughs> no. Here's a clue. Whoa, that looks amazing. I'll call Robert. I bet he'll have an idea. <laughs> Bye, Giles. Hi, Isabel. Hey, Robert. We need to find an animal that can help vision-impaired people see better. That's a really interesting question. Mm, do you have any clues? Have a look at this. Interesting. I'll investigate it. OK, I'll see you soon. Bye. So what animal could help blind people get around easier? Well, guide dogs help blind people get around more safely, but that seems a bit obvious. Maybe it's an animal with really great eyesight. Or maybe great eyesight isn't really the point. Maybe I need to think about an animal that gets around in the dark. What about owls? Or bats? Bats use sonar. It's also called echolocation. In fact, I've got it. I know an animal that has amazing echolocation. I'm here at the Tangaluma wild dolphin feeding with these two gorgeous dolphins. You want some food? There you go. Now, these guys are really, really amazing because dolphins use what's called echolocation. So basically, echolocation is when these guys use clicking noises to see things. They use sound to see. It sounds wild, but it's true. As I'm feeding them, they can actually use that echolocation and it's bouncing off my legs. It's so, so amazing. I reckon this is definitely the animal to help vision impaired people. Nice work, Robert. Thanks, check them out. They're so cool. Actually, I speak dolphin. So if you need a translation, you know where to come. But you're definitely on the right track with echolocation. I'm heading back to the lab right now to tell Isabel. Hey, Isabel. Oh, hey, Robert. So I've been researching echolocation and I think you might be onto something. Look at this. It says here that what dolphins do is very sophisticated, but the basic principle of echolocation is quite simple. And even humans can do it. How about we try to echolocate? Oh, yeah. Cool. Come over here. Can you make a clicking sound with your mouth? <laughs> cool. 
So, I've got this metal lid that I'm going to move past your face while you're clicking with your eyes closed. And you're going to give me the thumbs up when you think that it's in front of your face. Let's give it a try. All right. <laughs> you got it! Oh, cool. <laughs> OK, so now let's try it with me standing further back. Ready? Yep, ready. I don't think I got it that time. Maybe if I had better hearing, I could tell the difference. In fact, that's exactly how I think the sonar in a submarine works, by sending out pulses of sound and then hearing for what comes back, but with really sophisticated hearing technology. So when dolphins are using echolocation in the same way as a submarine, I guess they're just really good at hearing for what comes back. Yeah. You're both diving in the right direction. And in fact, Dolphin sonar can do far more than a submarine sonar can. They don't just see objects. They can detect objects that are hidden from view. They can detect a flounder buried beneath the sand or even see inside a shark to see whether or not it's eaten recently. Wow, that's amazing. Just like Superman's X-ray vision. Precisely. But how does it work? Dolphins don't make sounds with their throats. Instead, they use their nasal cavity, inside of which they have lip-like structures which they can use to make all sorts of sounds. Some of the sounds they make are for communication with other dolphins. Dolphin speak. But a lot of the sound they make is for echolocation, especially the fast clicking sounds and frequencies beyond human hearing. The dolphin picks up the echoes from these sounds through their lower jaw and transmits the signals to the brain which then turns them into a visual image of an area or object. It's brain power that turns sound into sight. Wow, what if visually impaired people could do that? And it doesn't seem to need eyes at all. Actually, it's already happening. Have a look at this. This vision, called 4D ultrasound, is made using sound waves and can see inside the mother showing the baby growing inside her womb. <laughs> that is incredible. Yes, and there is something else you have to see. Open the bag over there on the bench. It's called a sonar cane. Oh, let's give it a go. All right. Cool. OK, I'll turn it on. Oh, I can feel pulses of vibration. That's right. This cane mimics what a dolphin does. It emits and listens for sound. In this case, very low frequency sound that humans cannot hear. And then turns that sound into vibrations that you can feel in the handle. And the closer I get to something, the more intense are those vibrations. Give it a go. OK. Whoa, you're right. As soon as you get close to something, the pulses go really, really fast. Yeah. Oh. Let's test it out. OK. OK, here's the cane. Oop. Oh, I can feel it buzzing. Oh, there's something there. <laughs> oh. Good vibrations. <laughs> cool vibes, Robert. Whoa, it really works. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. And the technology is really similar to dolphins. Well done, guys. Now there's one more amazing thing you have to see. Some humans have even taught themselves to mimic what dolphins do. Come and meet Julianne. She is completely blind and uses echolocation to get around. Oh, I think that's her. Yeah. Hello, are you Julianne Bell? I am. Hello. I'm Robert. I'm Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I believe that you two want to learn about how blind people use echolocation. Yes. We call it flash sonar because mm -hmm. when we click, it's a little bit like a flash or lighting a match in the darkness, giving us a, a flash of sound. So every time I click, I'm able to get a flash of what's around me. Do you like to see how it works? Yes, please. Definitely. Sure. <laughs> come with me. Let's go for a wander. Oh, something big up here, guys. Yeah. OK. Seems quite tall. 
and it's got quite a ping, so I'm thinking it could be metallic, maybe? Yeah. You're exactly right. <laughs> it's a tall metal sign. Oh, right. Okay. It's tall. It's really tall. It's not wide. But it's hard. It's tall and skinny and hard. You're exactly right. It's a light pole. Oh, yeah. thank goodness. Well done. <laughs> okay. What have we got here? Mm. It's wide. It's tall. It's quite dense. I think way, way up there there might be leaves, but I'm too short. So I'm thinking it's a tree. <laughs> You're right. It's a tree. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow, so you can replicate similar techniques to a dolphin. It's been so interesting. You're amazing. <laughs> yeah, we have to head back to the lab now. So okay. We'll see you later. Okay, bye. See you soon. Bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. It's amazing how the dolphin's echolocation abilities have created so many new ways for us to see. It really does mix up what is sight and what is sound. Imagine what the future could hold. Yeah. I'd love to have x-ray vision. Or we could have a little gadget that could look inside your mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild, but true. <laughs> These energy guzzling units operate 24-7. They keep this apartment building cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And it's the same for loads of other buildings in this city. And the same for hundreds of other cities around the world. So isn't there a better way to keep us city slickers cool? Hmm. Hey, Giles. Isabel, I think you've hit on a hot idea. It's one of the great challenges of our time. How to make buildings more energy efficient. Air conditioning uses up to a third of a city's electricity. So, we need more energy smart buildings. Indeed. And I know for a fact that one of the world's most efficient buildings was inspired by some brilliant architects that just happen to be animals. If anyone can unearth their identity, it's you and Robert. Hey, Isabel. Hey, Robert. We need a cleaner, greener alternative to conventional air conditioning. And Giles says that the most energy-saving homes on Earth are already built by a certain animal. Any ideas? Did Giles give you any clues? Just this. Oh, that looks really cool. I'll get right on it. Every animal has its own way to cope with the elements. Grizzly bears escape the freezing winter months by hibernating. But I'm not sure that that makes a master builder. Meerkats dig underground tunnels to beat the sun. Picking's very impressive, but I'm looking for the ultimate home builders. Robert, you're building a good foundation, but I suggest you look at an animal home that isn't all underground. I'll see what I can find. What about bird's nests? They're mostly built above ground, but I'm not sure that they're energy efficient. Hi, Giles. You need to think of something really small that can build something really tall. Oh, OK. I'll keep looking. Coarse termites. These guys have the building bug big time. Wow. Look at these structures. They're easily two or three times my height. Oh. Hi, Robin. Hi, Isabel. You wanted the master builder? I give you the termite. Termites? I'll see what I can dig up about these little high achievers. <laughs> Bye, Robert. OK. Termites are great diggers. This is really interesting. The magnetic termite mounds are all aligned in exactly the same way, from north to south, like a compass needle. And apparently, it's a perfect way to soak up the morning and afternoon sun without getting too much exposure to the harsh midday sun. You're on the right track, but can I suggest you also consider an African species of termite? Look at this. Oh, 
So these Nigerian termites have a really elaborate ventilation system. It can circulate cool and warm air however they need. So maybe the tunnels in there are kind of acting like a chimney does. Maybe. Well, it says that there's a difference in air pressure between the top and the bottom, which creates the upward draft of a chimney. Well, blow me down. You're getting warm. Does it say anything there about the stack effect? Let me see. Yeah, it does. It says that hot air rises aided by the stack effect. In any breeze, the air higher up always moves faster than the air on the ground. And faster moving air at the top creates lower air pressure, which draws fresh air from near the ground into the termite nest, where it passes up through the chimney and to the outside. Sounds like you have to go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> so these termites have made their own air conditioning system and not a power socket in sight. I'm going to test how this works. Thanks, Giles. Hi, Robert. Can you meet me at the field lab? We've got an experiment to do. Great. See you soon. <laughs> Great. Bye. This is awesome. <laughs> so, what is it? This is actually representing a termite mound. OK. So, you see this yellow part? That's the ground. And this part underneath it is where the termites live. OK. And this is a stack or a chimney. So this is actually an experiment to demonstrate the stack effect. Let's see what happens when we turn the fan on. OK. The stack effect is when fast moving air blows over the top of a chimney, or in this case a stack, and it forces air to be sucked through it in an opening at the bottom. You can actually see in here the air being sucked into the termite mount. And you can see the circular motion it's creating. So, the airflow actually helps control the temperature. Yeah, exactly. Hi. That was a cool demonstration of the stack effect. Now you two should head back to the lab to see if that stack effect can be put to any use. Mm, OK, Ooh. cool. So that's so cool. Imagine being able to harness the energy of that natural airflow. All you'd need is a massive chimney that can suck in air from the bottom. Yeah, and then put it in a turbine, just like you would do with dams. Except you would use air, not water. I think this would be a good way to get a source of clean, green energy. Look, someone's already done it. Wow, they built a chimney power generator? Yeah, they call it the Solar Updraft Tower. The airflow principles mastered by termites have already been applied to produce electricity. A large flat greenhouse uses the energy from the sun to heat air underneath the glass roof. The hot air wants to rise and flows into the base of a huge chimney. And as the air gets warmer, the airflow increases. Spinning turbines are located at the bottom. That's amazing. One day they may be a common source of power. They are very expensive to build. So in the meantime, I suggest you focus on what the termites use their mound for, to live in. OK, I think we need to take another look at how we can use the knowledge of termites and kind of see how they can build those massive structures. Yeah, because those holes in the termite mounds must do a lot more than just letting stale air out. Yeah. That's right, Isabel. The Nigerian termite mounds are not only extremely tall, but they also reach far underground. And at the end of the deepest tunnels are huge evaporative cooling plates that dramatically reduce the temperature further. Made of mud, they absorb moisture from the colony above. As the moisture evaporates, it further cools the air coming in from the outside. Clever little mites, aren't they? Hey, Robert, let's see if we can replicate the termites air conditioning system. OK. See you. Here we go. All right. OK. So this is the temperature of the stack before the dishcloths went in. 22.3 degrees. So now, can you see these pink dishcloths that I've placed in here? These are going to be representing the evaporation plates inside the ground of a termite mound. First, we get the faster airflow happening. Now we wait and see if the dishcloth evaporation plates help cool down our makeshift termite mound. OK, let's take another temperature reading of the stack and see if it's cooled down. OK. Oh, uh, look at that. 19.2 degrees. It has cooled down by a couple of degrees. Yeah, this really works. 
Well done, kids. You did it. Now let me show you a masterpiece of biomimicry, a building inspired by the Nigerian termites' ingenious handiwork. The architect tried to emulate how the termites regulated temperatures inside their homes. And it doesn't use conventional air conditioning? I think that's a question for the architect himself, Mick Pierce, who is waiting for you online. Hi, Isabel, and hi, Robert. Hi, Mr. Pierce. So how did you become interested in termites? I was asked to make an office block in Harare. And while walking around in the bush, I saw these chimneys. Termite mounds. So how exactly have you copied the termites' architecture? The problem in an office block is getting rid of the heat. So what I do is to blow cold air through hundreds of tunnels of concrete and masonry in the building, including these chimneys. And they help to pull the air out by stack effect. And it comes out into the offices about four or five degrees cooler than it is outside. The stack effect. We just learned about that. Thanks for talking with us, Mr. Pierce. Cheerio, kids. It's been nice talking to you. Now that is one very cool building, and it works in a similar way to a termite mound. At night, cool air is blown into the concrete tunnels and up through the building, drawing the hot air up and out the chimneys at the top. Maybe in the future, we could not just have one or two really energy efficient buildings, but actually have a whole city that's energy efficient. Funny you should say that, Robert. Some forward thinkers believe that entire cities could be designed using Mother Nature's blueprint. Take a look at this. Behold, an entire city housed in one three-kilometer high tower. Look familiar? Whoa, the cities of the future designed by termites. That's wild, but true. 